Hello, my quilting friends. My name is Leah Day, and welcome to episode 88 of the podcast. Today, I am chatting with Sue Griffith, and she is an awesome quilt maker. She happens to be also the oldest quilt maker I have ever had on the podcast at 84 years old. And how I met Sue is she is Anne Walsh's mom. And after chatting with Anne and hitting it off with her, uh, I just had the idea, like, why don't I talk to your mom too, since she's also a quilter. She is predominantly a hand quilter and has been quilting since 1981. I really want to just gain as many different insights and experiences as I can. And gathering these stories, it just, it really feels amazing. Just, and also, I'll be completely honest, it gives me the excuse to say, hey, can I have a talk with you and not seem like a weirdo? <laughs> So yeah, my goal is to talk to as many different types of quilters as I possibly can. I don't care if you run a business or you're a professional, you're a hobbyist. If you'd like to be on the show and have a cool quilting chat with me and become a new quilting friend, please get in touch. You can send us an email at leahday.com contact. I am probably gonna take a break on interviews for the next couple of weeks for the holidays, uh, but I will be back at that in January. So we'll schedule a time sometime to chat in January or February. So the beginning of every podcast episode, I always chat about what I'm doing around the house and uh, I'm usually working on it actively, <laughs> which is why you usually hear me wrestling around and making some noise in the background. Uh, so today I am in the crafty cottage and I have given myself permission to pull out a very special collection of fabrics that I have been stashing for years. Now, you know, I put a hurtin' on my entire quilting cotton fabric stash this year. I cut up everything into five inch squares uh, and we've been selling off collections of those five inch squares for our friendship quilt along. Well, that was only part of my sewing stash, of my fabric stash. Uh, and so I have pulled out my collection of silks and uh, this is Silk Dupion. I think I'm pronouncing that right. I used to pronounce it Silk Dupioni because that's what it looked like to me, but I might be pronouncing that. I might be butchering that completely and that's okay, forgive me. Pronunciation's not my strong suit. Um, so yeah, I have all of this stuff and I have been stashing it. You know how it's kind of like um, you put away your nicest things and it's like, oh, one day, one day I get to play with that. One day I'll make a quilt with that. One day I will uh, experiment and play with those silks and be able to pull them out and have a good time with them. And I realize it's really silly to have that mentality, you know, one day, one day, one day, because that one day might not happen. You know, I might wake up one day and not be able to make quilts anymore. Uh, I'm not the same way that I'm able to today. My house might burn down. I'm not kidding. You know, we have big fish tanks and stuff and Josh has had friends whose houses have burned down because of their fish tanks. So it's, you know, not completely out of the realm of possibility that my house could burn down. I mean, that's kind of fatalistic and bad thinking, but still I'm just pointing out that if we one day ourselves forever, at what point are we going to actually be able to use and enjoy the things that we're hoarding away, we're stashing away for that one day we get to use it? Uh, and I was also really inspired by Katie Baker and learning how she tackled uh, quilting over vinyl and leather. And I've had this fabric stashed away for so long and I have a special project that I'd like to use it in. So I shared the image of my new goddess quilt a couple weeks ago and I took the time to really work on that design and refine it. And then I've just scanned it into my computer. So it's like the first step of the design process has begun. <laughs> so uh, that's like the first step. I need to actually draw it in Illustrator and get it drawn out. But this is definitely going to be my next goddess quilt. And I realized that I'm really wanting something different. My uh, last two goddess quilts, that would be uh, Duchess Reigns and Dream Goddess, which I finally just finished and gotten on the wall. They were both done in hand dyed fabrics. And that was a phase I was going through several years ago. And, you know, not at all what I'm into now. Uh, and it's really interesting. I can look through my quilts and see these different phases that I've gone through. And, you know, it's different phases through the fabrics that I was buying and different phases of the things, you know, I, I was kind of in the dyeing phase. I was thinking, oh, it'll be cheaper to dye my own fabric and get the exact color that I want. I think everybody goes through that phase. And 
eventually you realize, wow, this is a lot of extra work. And <laughs> while hand-dyed fabrics are gorgeous, and I really love those quilts that I did with them, um, I found on Dream Goddess especially, the fabrics, the colors started to fade more than I wanted to. Uh, and I don't know whether that was just a mistake that I made in the dyeing process or I didn't add enough soda ash or, you know, whatever. It was, there's a lot of trial and error that goes into this. And when you rush off and go make a big giant quilt that takes three years to finish, sometimes you don't really know what you're going to get. And I'm not at all upset about how that quilt turned out. Not at all. But... I look at it going, God, it would be so nice if those fabrics were just a little bit brighter and just a little bit more bold and just stood out just a little bit more, you know? Uh, and I had to think back to that quilt that I saw. The only quilt that I photographed at Quilt Festival was a quilt that when I got up close to it, I realized that the pieces were made out of silk and they seemed to glow. The, the light shining, it's a very dark place, but they have all these lights shining down on the quilts and so it kind of illuminates them out of the darkness of the, of the cloth drapes that they have behind everything. And that silk just seemed to glow against those bright lights. It was gorgeous. So that stuck with me and I, you know, kind of like put it in a little, a little worm in the back of my brain was like, silk, silk, silk. You got to play with that silk you've been hoarding for years. So that is what I'm doing. I'm going to prep up all of the silk, probably give it another starch. Right now I'm just pressing this piece I can tell was starched and pressed. And it looks like I cut out a big chunk of it for something at some point. And then I put, you know, obviously just put it away at that point and, you know, then stashed it and... Uh, now I'm pressing it flat and I'll probably spray it with some starch. And so the biggest limitation here is I don't have yards and yards of this stuff. I have little pieces. Uh, sometimes I'll have an entire yard. Sometimes I'll have a half yard. It was kind of just, it was all purchased very randomly. I would, you know, run across a, um, a vendor at a, you know, show. I would run across a yard or two online. Yeah, this is a very strange collection of fabrics and it was you know, picked up over the course of several years. And then, you know, I never did anything with it. So when I feel like collections of fabrics like this, you know, they're very, they're very loved, but they're very underloved in the sense of you don't know what you have and not knowing what you have kind of keeps you stuck not using it. And so what I'm doing is kind of taking an inventory here and dad is prepping up some in the house too. So that way, by the end of the day, I'm hoping all of this will be pressed flat, nice and, you know, flattened out. And I'm going to be able to see what I have, how much fabric I have. And then from that, be able to decide on what technique I can use to construct this quilt. And I'm leaning towards, and this is going to sound insane, uh, hand applique. So uh, probably freezer paper hand applique. And yeah, mostly it's just I'm in the mood for hand work. <laughs> You know, I go with whatever I'm most in the mood to do at the at the, any given time. And then four or five years later, I'm like, why did I choose that very time consuming method? Uh, but yeah, that's what I'm in the mood for right now. I might change my mind, but I'm just in the mood to make those perfect stitches and make those smooth curves. And I'm really in the mood to have no stitching along the edges. I want to be able to see that beautiful turned edge and the stitching hidden you know, in that, in that turned edge. So I'm wanting all of that. And I think the silk will be amazing to work with. And especially freezer paper applique, I think works really well for silk because this stuff frays like crazy. Once you cut it, it just kind of goes nuts. But when you're working with freezer paper applique, it's a, it's a nice deep turned edge. So it doesn't even matter that it frays like crazy. Another option would be kind of a, a mock mola technique where I layer, layer, layer all the different fabrics I plan to use and then stitch and then cut away the layers and then turn the edge. That's kind of how a um, Hawaiian quilt is made. And that's really interesting. I'm not sure I like the needle turn aspect of it because you, you kind of turn the edge as you go versus turning the edge all at the beginning with freezer paper. You don't have a guide or a template with uh, Hawaiian quilting. So I don't know, I'm, I'm kind of knocking around all of these ideas, but I will be completely honest. I've kind of been starting and stopping with this goddess. I have so many different projects I feel like that are in progress. And, you know, I was working on Mally, I was working on her jeans, and I have some 
different paintings I'm doing and stuff, just some watercolors and stuff. I'm playing with that. And it was just, this kept feeling like it was being pushed back, pushed back, pushed back. And I finally had to say this morning, it's like, well, if I don't start prepping up that fabric, it's never going to happen. So I can use that at the beginning of the podcast. <laughs> so yeah, that's why I am starching and pressing all of this fabric as I share this with you this week. And I do appreciate that. You know, the podcast helps me step back and tap into what is the most important thing for me to be working on. And sometimes in, you know, just the hustle and bustle of like, you know, what's next, what's next, you know, and you know, what's the next step for this big project that we're working on, or what's the next step for the quilt along? Um, it's really nice to tap into what do I need to work on right this second for me? And this feels like that. So I really appreciate that. And I hope that you enjoy hearing my long-winded tangents <laughs> as I share the intro of each podcast. And I have to say, um, I gained a lot of insight this week. Over the weekend, I shared a post, uh, a blog post first, and ask a very simple question. And that is, are you still reading quilting blogs? And, you know, my main reason was I have started to really pay attention to my behavior online. And I will be honest, I'm not all that impressed by how I've been acting. Uh, and what I mean by that is I, you know, if there's something I need, so let's say in, in the example that I gave in the blog post was I was looking for a gluten-free keto sugar cookie recipe that used a very specific sweetener, the swerve sweetener that I like to use. And that is a pretty extremely specific desire, right? But Pinterest is great for that. Pinterest is where you can go for diet specific recipes and you can see a million pretty photos and it's instant gratification. And it's not one, but like 50 people competing for the best keto, swerve, sugar, gluten-free, sugar cookie recipe. Now I didn't actually make this cookie, but I'm just saying, if you're looking for something like that, Pinterest is the place to go. But my behavior is I go there, I search, I look at the photos and the prettiest one or the one that catches my eye or the one that says swerve in it or keto in it that I think is going to be successful. I click on it. I go to it. Uh, I go to the website. It's usually a blog. There is usually a mile of text and images and it's one after the other after the other. And it's annoying. And I'll tell you exactly why cooking blogs do that. They do that for two reasons. Number one, the images get pinned to Pinterest and that's where they're getting their traffic, you know, because they know that Pinterest is a place where people go to look for diet specific recipes. So number one, that's why they're loading it full of images. And then to keep you on the site for the three to five seconds that you really need to be on any particular site for your traffic to be really beneficial for that blog. Also, uh, they kind of mix in ads in between and pop-ups in between the photos, which, you know, you never know, you might click on something and then they get a little bit of income from that. It's extremely annoying. <laughs> and when I shared this post, a lot of people agreed with me, but they are doing that and they're writing it that way and doing all those photos for that specific reason. It, it generates a level of income and traffic uh, to do it that way. But, I don't pay attention to any of that. I scroll, scroll, scroll past all of that nonsense, ignoring all of the pretty photos, even though they're gorgeous, and ignoring all of the text because I don't really care. I just want the recipe. And I want to check the recipe ingredients and make sure that it's going to be in line with the diet uh, or what I want or what I have on hand uh, with the sugar that I want to use. I click print and then I'm gone. I have not left any piece of myself behind. I have not left an email address. I have not left a comment. I have not shown any sign of appreciation. I have not even checked the name of the blog usually, so I don't know who in the world shared that. Uh, and I certainly have not, you know, really gotten to know that person in any way or uh, gained any perspective about them. And this is my behavior and I work online and I know how much work it is to do all those photos and write that text and put that recipe together and the whole nine yards of that. And so when I noticed that that's what I've been doing, I really had to stop and take a step back because if I'm doing this, then everybody else is probably doing it too. You know, and people that don't realize how much work, I mean, hours and hours and hours of work, just shooting the photos, 
Uh, just for an example, the photos that I put, I think it was 36 photos in Mally, the Ma in uh, Miss Funny Quilt Pattern. In that doll pattern, it was 36 photos. I shot photos for six hours straight, and it was something like, it was over 300 photos that I ended up shooting. And then, I'll, and you know, what, after editing, after condensing, after figuring out exactly what I needed, only 36 of them were used out of a six hour photo shoot. And that just lets you know, these cooking blogs where they're shooting every single step, that's doubling, if not tripling, the amount of time it takes them to make that recipe. And sure, it's helping them test the recipe and all that kind of good stuff. And certainly, no, we don't need pictures of mixing bowls and dough and all that kind of nonsense, but they're doing it for a reason. And the reason is traffic and um, search engine optimization and all that good stuff. So it's really made me stop and tap into what I'm doing, the work that I'm doing, what I'm sharing, and asking the very simple question is, should I continue to do this? When, you know, if, if this is how I'm acting with a recipe blog, is this how other people are acting with my blog and quilting and free patterns and, um, you know, the designs that I've shared too. And quilting, you know, over, over the course of the weekend, I got a lot of comments and a lot of input from a lot of people. And what I found through that uh, was that quilting and cooking are not really, you're not really considering the same thing. They're not apples to apples. So a, a free recipe is kind of like uh, fast food. It's not really the main event. And it's not really something that people value. You know, they could take it, they could leave it, and they're not going to be truly engaged with that recipe because they just want what they want and then they're gonna click away. And I was not the only one that, you know, said, yes, I do that. So that was really interesting. But most quilters were saying that they do not consider quilting blogs, videos, or podcasts in the same way. You know, that they're, they are, engaging more with it and f feel that it is more valuable. However, I posted this as a blog post and I told that story. And then I also posted the question to Instagram and Facebook too. And it was interesting to see how the different people that commented on the different platforms had different answers, you know, predominant answers. Of course, the people on the blog do read the blog, the people on Instagram and Facebook, not necessarily. And more than anything else, what most quilters were saying is time. Time is a limitation. We all have, and there's so much out there that it's overwhelming. And it's kind of like, you know, most, I think most of us are saying, okay, I don't need this right this second. Like, oh, that's a great tutorial on Quilt As You Go, but I don't need this right this second, so I'm gonna save it and I'll come back to it later when I do need it. And that's fine, you know? Um, I would take, you know, just simply being bookmarked <laughs> So you can come back later and check things out rather than having you click away and then never come back and never remember, you know, where you found that uh, or who I was. So there was definitely that as an element. Um, I definitely gained an interesting perspective on the podcast. A lot of people have said that they don't like podcasts or can't listen. Then we have a whole other subset of people that are saying, I only listen. I don't want to read. <laughs> I only want to listen to stuff as I'm sewing, as I'm quilting. So I think this is really interesting. My father-in-law hates audiobooks, like cannot listen to an audiobook because he can't uh, listen and digest the information. Uh, and I pretty much only read books via audiobooks. If I have to like actually hold the printed copy of the book, um, it will take me months to read it because I'm just slow at it. I don't have a lot of time for reading. You know, if I do read, it's usually taking a bath. Uh, and you know, I'll read for several hours on end, but it's not like I do that every night. You know, that's more of like a weekend treat kind of thing. So that was an interesting perspective. There's definitely seems to be people that like podcasts, people that like videos, people that like a written blog post, people that like the blog post, but no photos because the photos take forever to load and they annoy them. And I realized that I actually have that same thing going on myself. In my house, I have a slow Wi-Fi connection upstairs. So if I'm searching for something upstairs, I will be searching for text, maybe a few photos. But if the site has too many ads and junk on it, it is very irritating because I'm on my phone usually and kind of scrolling through stuff. And if things are interrupting me, it's very annoying. It makes the flow very difficult. 
if I'm on my big computer downstairs, I have a great Wi-Fi connection. So there I will turn on a video if I want to learn something and I'll listen to it, usually not watching it. I'll usually listen to it and absorb the content. And I can say this, you know, definitely this was my workflow. I've been learning a lot about audio recording this last week. I rented some mics. I rented an audio recorder. I finally got the right setup to do my audiobook recording for Mally the Maker because being an audio person, like I love audiobooks, I knew Mally the Maker would be something that I want to turn into an audiobook. So I've been learning all this crazy technical stuff about audiobook recording. And when I'm upstairs, I will search and read. When I'm downstairs, I will look for a video and have somebody tell me their experience or, or their opinion. So it's very interesting, you know, kind of trying to absorb all of these different opinions and trying to understand how things are changing because um, the internet is going to get faster. I don't know if you realize this, but they are developing um, special, you know, new fiber optic cables and braided cables and stuff that will make the internet even faster than it is now. And, you know, so those, you know, speed issues are going to go away. So you're going to get even more instant gratification. You know, things are going to load faster. Things are going to be popping up even faster, but there's only so much we can absorb. There's only so much time that we can read. There's only so much time that we can even listen. And I find even the podcasts that I do follow and like to listen to regularly, I go through fits and spurts with those even. When I'm in the middle of pattern writing or testing, I can't listen to anything because my brain is already too full of just all this stuff. I need to make sure that this is working right. I need to make sure that I'm not going to make a mistake. If I'm shooting photos or video along with it, I can't listen to anything because I'm constantly, you know, switching stuff around and using so much equipment that it's just a pain. So, you know, I realize I go through fits and spurts with this stuff and please, I don't want you to feel bad. <laughs> That's the thing I said in the podcast, uh, sorry, in the video and the, um, in the blog post that I wrote about this is, no, I don't want to quit. And no, don't feel bad. Mostly I'm just wanting experiences. I'm wanting to understand how, you know, your perspective on how things are changing and what you want to see more of and how you want to see it. Because it's very good to ask and it's very good to check in on what you're doing and how you're doing it because things change and doing the same thing over and over and over again and expecting the same results, you know, is, uh, it, it's, it's just not going to happen. It's really not. So it's definitely, hmm, it's definitely been working on me and I've been trying to just sit and be still with this and absorb what people are saying and not, you know, get my feelings hurt or, you know, anything like that. I, I asked, so I wanted honesty and honest opinions. And um, one thing that I have picked up on several times, a lot of people have said that I really haven't supported advanced or intermediate quilters as much as I have helped beginners. So I am very good at taking someone and helping them from a beginner level, total beginner level to intermediate and even advanced. But I have not really done very many advanced um, books or patterns or projects. Uh, certainly haven't done anything like that for a quilt along. And the reason is it's a smaller pool of people. And generally those people are advanced and know what they're doing and can reverse engineer things, which is not a lot of fun. <laughs> I'll be honest. When I put, um, you know, if something is more advanced then it's gonna take me more time to produce it. It's gonna take me more time to write that and plan it and test it and make sure it's all going to work properly. And because of that, then, you know, it takes more time. It takes more effort. It takes more energy. Um, and then it is going into a smaller pool of people that are a lot more savvy and can reverse engineer. And so then if they look at it and say, oh, well, I can do that on my, on, on my own. I don't need you. Then that's what they're going to do. And, and this is just, you know, again, I'm not being critical. I'm just simply pointing out that this is reality and I can't, you know, I, I have to work with what I got. <laughs> I can't, you know, just say, oh, I'm going to go spend six months working on a goddess quilt along or a, you know, a goddess, uh, a goddess workshop and then have, you know, five people show up to take it. Uh, that would kill my business. <laughs> so I can't do that. 
So my main focus is just looking at the time that I am spending and doing things and the enjoyment that I get out of it because that is a, a great part of it. And I would love to do a goddess workshop or something along those lines. Um, I would absolutely love to do that because that would be something that would be, you know, for me first. I would enjoy that, you know, quite a lot. Um, but it's balancing that also with making sure that we can keep the lights on. <laughs> and, you know, and that is something that I am always, you know, focused on because it is just me and Josh and dad. And uh, the internet is changing in a way that is sometimes very scary. And I try not, I try not to get freaked out, but especially lately it's been very hard because basically things are changing where before it would be, you know, you search free motion quilting and you're going to find me very easily because I wrote the free motion quilting project and shared a huge number of tutorials for free online. Well, things are changing and I don't think you realize that um, the search engines are not necessarily showing you the most relevant or the best post, but sometimes they are showing you the one that has paid the most to get up to the top. And in that way, it has become corrupted uh, and it's understandable. You know, um, there's a lot behind all of this, but, but in short, there are some companies that have a lot more money than someone like me. And if they see a profit in making sure that their blog is number one, then it's gonna be number one and that's how it's gonna go. So that has freaked me out <laughs> quite a bit. And I've been trying to just kind of stay calm about it and you know tap into the things that I can control because if I freak out and focus on the things I can't control that are completely out of my ability to do anything about them then I'm going to stop quilting I'm going to stop creating and I'm just going to be a scared puddle on the floor so that's you know really why I I asked the question over the weekend and I really appreciate hearing everybody's thoughts I love doing this podcast. This does take up a lot of my time, but I really enjoy the podcast as well. Um, hearing what everybody is wanting as far as information has definitely changed my perspective as far as the podcasts that I shoot that are sharing a very specific information. Like recently I shared the uh, how to quilt on in a tiny sewing space somebody commented on that video and was very irritated. You know, they were like, I don't have time to listen to all this stuff about your, you know, your life and your house and all this other stuff. And she was very rude. <laughs> and that is the last comment that she will ever post to YouTube, at least on my channel. And that's okay. I can set those boundaries and say, this is the way I shoot the podcast and this is the way I want to share. And that's up to me as the content creator. But I'm also gaining the perspective of, okay, you know, there are people that have so little time to listen or to watch and they want just that little bit of content. They want just that little answer, question answered. Well, I can shoot shorter videos for that and still enjoy sharing and, um, you know, kind of doing, going deeper and sharing my personal side in the podcast and keep that just about that. And that's okay too. Um, it's, I think it's really good. It's kind of like I've been tapping into lately is just, like what makes me me is that I'm constantly asking and trying to dive deep and figure out what is the next best step and um, thinking through my process. And I don't think a lot of people do that necessarily. And I think it's really good to take a step back very, very often and check in on what all is going on and um, the actions that we're taking. And I've been noticing I'm very cluttered in the house. My organization has gone out the window. I've got a lot of stuff all over the place. And I'm kind of going, this is driving me nuts. This is driving me absolutely nuts. It's so messy. And I never would have thought that I'm a clean person. I, you know, I'm not, I'm a very untidy person, but I am definitely starting to feel like um, just spending 30 minutes every day to clean up and find places for these things or just to throw things away would be really, really good. So yeah, a lot of, lot of different things going on. Some of them have to do with something I'm going to share later on this month. And I think you'll gain a greater understanding of why I'm feeling this need to shake things up and just really be critical of my time expenditure. 
because in 2019 or 2020, I'm looking at having a lot less time <laughs> for this. And I need to keep that in perspective. And I also just personally, and I am really, really wanting to spend more time writing. Of all of the things that I have done this year, uh, I really love writing and I really want to do more and more and more of that. And Mally the Maker, I finally got back to 30,000 words after oh, murdering a whole ton of characters and, <laughs> and having to delete and delete and delete a lot. And I have learned some very, very important lessons with this book. I'm working on Mally the Maker, uh, second book in the series. And I have actually found the second book to be harder to write than the first, but not in a bad way. I, I am loving the story now. I'm getting into the meat of it, which is really, really good. But I had to really have a trial by fire first in order to be able to come in and go, okay, this is what's going on. This is how I need to move forward. And I learned my lessons. And that's the thing. I, I have to stop and wonder in this world that we have built where everything is instant gratification and get your question answered right this second, right now, you know, no wait. You know, I don't even want to wait like so long for you to introduce yourself. Like just give me the content. I just wonder if anyone is going to have the ability to slow down and actually gain the skill required to do what they want to do. And that's the thing. Like, I don't care how much you want to make a quilt. You are going to have to slow down and learn what a quarter inch seam is and learn how to cut out some pieces. I mean, you could use pre-cuts, but you're gonna have to learn at least how to use a sewing machine or how to stitch by hand. And, you know, you can watch videos all day long, but it's, you're never going to be able to speed up the actual process of doing it. And so taking the time to learn the craft is so important. And I've definitely checked in this weekend about how important it is to not just go and get the recipe and download it and be off, but to stop and show that little bit of appreciation, to leave a comment, to leave my email address behind and say, thank you, I really appreciate this. This is exactly what I was looking for. I really love cooking with Swerve or whatever. But to show some sign of appreciation that that person didn't just write that blog post, shoot all those pictures and put all that stuff up there and teach to an empty classroom. Because that's what it feels like when you don't get comments on a blog post. It feels like you're teaching to an empty space and there's no one there to appreciate it. So that's my kind of long rambling tangent about, <laughs> you know, workflow and the internet and the changing world and all that kind of good stuff. I am definitely thinking about a lot of things differently and challenging my, you know, what I've been doing for years and looking to shake things up a bit. I will be completely honest, but please don't worry. I will not be going away. It just might be in different ways from here on out. We'll see. I, I have a lot to share with you for our end of the year post when I share my word of the year and I still haven't quite picked that quite yet. So we'll see. So that's it for this intro. I hope that you've enjoyed hearing this little bit of a rambly tangent about the internet and the changing face of blogs and all of this good stuff. Um, I'm not going anywhere. I love what I do. I want to continue doing it, but I also really want to spend more time writing and sharing quilt books and designing awesome new quilts. I wanna do that too. And finding that balance is gonna be something I'm really seeking in the next year. So that's it for the intro. Now I hope you enjoy the interview with Sue Griffith, who happens to be Ann Walsh's mom and an amazing quilter since 1981. Hello, my quilting friends. My name is Leah Day, and I am here with Sue Griffith. She is a hobby quilter, and she happens to be Ann Walsh's mom and is the oldest quilter that we've had on the show so far at 84 years old. So thank you so much for being on the show today, Sue. Welcome. Thank you for having me. So a little introduction, Sue has been a hand quilter since 1981 when she made her first quilt, motivated by her desire to give a special gift to her brother. She has hand quilted several quilts over the years and now at the age of 84 continues to sew and hand quilt smaller projects, both most often to support local charities. 
So let's start with that project that you made for your brother, that first project. What did it look like and how did you make it? Well, it was um, a gift for him for the 25th anniversary of his ordination to the priesthood. And it's really hard to make a quilt for a, a fellow, or let alone a priest. <laughs> but he loved to cook. And so I found a pattern in one of the old McCall's needlework books, the great big huge books, um, that was called a banquet quilt. And it was a table with eight place settings with china, and I added crystal, and it had all the food in the middle of the table, and, and, and I added things to the menu, and, and consequently it got bigger and bigger and bigger. And uh, it was, I just connected placemats and applique. It was all hand applique. And of course, in those days, there was no such thing as raw edge applique. It was all needle turn. <laughs> And uh, it took me about two years. Wow. And I worked, I worked on nothing else. I'm, when I start a project, I finish it before I start something else. And uh, I had a fabric store at the time, and I didn't know what I could give him. And one of the ladies who worked for me suggested that a quilt would be a really special thing. She was a quilter. And I had uh, no idea where to start. And she helped me very much. I didn't even know about binding a quilt. I, I turned the seam allowances in all the way around 104 <laughs> inch square quilt <laughs> and hand stitched. Wow. Yeah, yeah. And I did it on a, I just had two two by fours and two sawhorses. And um, I had to zigzag lead fabric from the two sides to keep it taut at the sides. And so that's how we did it in those days. Yeah. So, yes. uh, so you needle turn, so let me, let me kind of break it down. So uh -huh. you needle turned all of the applique, you did it in separate pieces. So it was kind of quilt as you go, or did you quilt no, it? Okay. No, I, well, I hand quilted the place mats with the china and the crystal glass and the cutlery, the tines of the fork I had to embroider because I don't, didn't know how to cut out tines. And there was like salad and, and turkey and ham. And, and he always had a bottle of wine. He made his own wine. And, and so I put that. And he always had the, the bread on a board. Everybody cut their own bread. And so I did that for him. And yeah, it was, it was fun. It was a real challenge. It sounds but, amazing. And so describe your, um, your hand quilting frame. You said it was two sawhorses and two two-by-fours. That sounds it, super simple. Yeah, that's all. And then I just thumbtacked. The, the edge to the front and the other edge to the back and then rolled the two by fours at the back and as I progressed I unrolled the front and carried on up to the back wow you're making me want to build a hand quilting frame <laughs> with two by fours <laughs> I've, actually, I've actually been tempted I had my first hand quilting experience this year um this fall I went to Hart Square and I sat around a frame and hand quilted with several other ladies and it was such an amazing experience and it's making me want to build a frame and like strap it to the ceiling when I'm not using it oh. um, pull it down once a month and have some friends over and we all hand quilt once a month or something like that. It's making me want to do yeah. that. Uh, but right. now that you've described that, I'm like, I'm thinking, well, yeah, that's absolutely doable with some two by fours and some saw horses. Yes. Why not? Um, Very simple. Yeah. Yeah. So tell me about the patterns. Did you just echo quilt? Like what was your quilting pattern? Uh, on that quilt? Oh, I just um, went around the outside of each article. I didn't know anymore. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, I so, completely understand. Yeah. I mean, just, just the, the level of creativity, just what you've described sounds amazing. I would love to see a picture of it. If you happen to have one, that would be great. I do. I do have a picture of it. There's no way I can do that right now, though. Oh, of course not. Of course, that's fine. No, but no. yeah, we'll, I, we'll share I, it in the show notes. And, and will help and, and get that to you. So, and it did have like uh, 12 inch borders and then, and then I put a dessert in each corner <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I, I cross hatched in three inch squares, the, the four borders, the, it was chocolate brown. The table was, was uh, orange and, and all in earth tone colors. Cause those were my favorite colors at the time. Yeah. So you said that you owned a fabric shop. Tell me about yeah. that. Um, I owned the, the store from 73 to 82. And um, 
In those days, of course, there was not the quilting that's being done today. It was all dress goods. So anybody who wanted to quilt was dealing with polyester cotton, which is, and that's what my quilt was was done with. It would have been much easier in cotton because it's forgiving. You know, you can stretch a little bit here and pull a little bit there, but with poly cotton, you can't do that. So it made it a little bit harder, but I knew nothing about quilting cottons. I don't know if there was a lot of quilting, hand quilting done outside of the city where I lived. It was a small city and I was the only fabric store. So I can't say that that machine quilting wasn't done in those days because I don't know. Sure, sure. So tell me just about a, a little bit about selling dressmaker goods and like what you did. Did you teach people how to make clothing? And No, okay. no. I was a self-taught sewer. I made for the children. I, I never even made my own clothes um, before I was married. And then I sewed for the family. So, and then I taught Anne, of course. <laughs> <laughs> and she worked in the store with me when she got older. Yeah. And so you guys were primarily selling, though, to people that then already knew how to make their own clothes. Yes. Okay. Yes. There were no, no lessons. No, no lessons. I wasn't qualified. No. <laughs> it sounds like you certainly were, though. <laughs> so I tell me how, you, what I'd love to, to hear from you is kind of how things have changed, because I'm so sure getting started in the 80s and, you know, you've been hand quilting and kind of uh, observing, you know, and seeing how things have changed. Can you remark anything on, on that, on just anything that you've noticed on how colors have changed or how, like, if there has been any shapes or blocks that have kind of come in and out of vogue? Anything like that you picked up on? Well, color is an interesting thing because when I see the colors in the quilts today, I, I, I look and I say, I would never have put those colors together. <laughs> but, you know, they're beautiful when they're done. You know, I, I look at Anne's work and, and, and I just can't believe that these colors I never would have chosen. Like what? Give me an example. They go together. They just blend and they just look so beautiful, you know. But um, And then I used to think, you know, machine quilting. Well, that was kind of like cheating yeah. to me, you know. But then you think people used to hand sew their dresses together. And now they use machines and I use a machine. So what's the difference? You know, I guess I'm cheating too. <laughs> We're all cheating in, in one way or the other. I mean, we in buy milk from the other. grocery store. <laughs> yeah, that's right. But all of a sudden then the, the fabric stores started to change. You know, the dress goods were disappearing and the quilting fabrics were coming in. And so, but I was out of the business by that time. But there's still a lot of hand quilters around. You know, one of my customers, when I had the store, she was an elderly woman, and she had three quilt frames in her kitchen and living room. In her kitchen. She used to walk around to cook her meals, and and uh, she was just amazing. But three with sawhorses and two with horse. Yeah, and I, I heard whenever I was um, doing the hand quilting with the other ladies that the reason why you'd keep it in the kitchen is because it was warmer in there. Yeah. You really do <laughs> cool down just setting yeah. still and stitching for That's long periods nice. of time. So yes. it, was, it was nice and warm in the kitchen usually. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So um, have there that you're seeing now, you know, you're see, you said that there's some color mixtures that you would never choose to do. Oh. Can you tell me what colors specifically, like you would never put those together? Well, like teal and yellow, like, <laughs> and navy blue. I just, I can't fe feature me using those colors. But, you know, I'm more, and the baby quilts, like they've changed. For us, it was shades of pink and white for little girls and soft blues and for boys. And now, you know, the quilts are just really exciting when you look at these little baby quilts that are coming along. Sure, yeah. sure. And I'm sure that the style has changed, too, where, you know, maybe was there more of an emphasis on heirloom and, you know, kind of more of a whole cloth style? Or has it always been yes. very pieced? And, and a lot of these tiny pieces, you know, triangles, half square triangles, things, which which I've never been into. I don't enjoy doing those. But uh, and now it's more strips and squares making up a block of multi 
patches, which is, is nice. I mean, they're fun. They're fun. And, and anybody who wants to learn, you know, it's exciting for them to put together a block with just patches. And I still use, I still use small pieces. Of course, now with my smaller projects, you know, like right now I'm, I'm making some hexy or, uh, ornaments for Christmas tree and, and I'm just using little pieces that I've saved. I don't throw anything away. Mind you, I have started giving away some scraps to a guild because they do a lot of charity quilts. And then I know they're going somewhere to do some good. Good, good. So tell me about what you're working on right now. What's on your machine right now? I don't have anything going right now. No. I um, made a bunch of blocks up for this guild and got those all done. And I have a friend who is a member of the guild and she takes them away from me and, and the girls. She distributes them and that's how they're used. But I'm like I say, I'm just doing these ornaments and I like to think do things for the the hampers for the food bank, you know, just like a pot holder or something that's a bit pretty and exciting rather than just groceries. <laughs> so at this time of the year I'm just kinda, you know, I wake up in the morning and I think, I'm gonna do this today. You know, it gets me out of bed. Mm -hmm. I may not do anything, but it gets me out of bed. And and at my age, you have to have things that get you out of bed. Yeah. So tell me about that. What would you say has, you know, I mean, you've been quilting since the 80s. Your life yes. has changed dramatically. Uh, can you just give us a little bit of perspective? I'm 35. So I'm, you know, I have a very different perspective on life. Yes. And I'd love to just yeah. learn from you and what you really appreciate now at 84. Well, I appreciate that I live in my own home. I have good people who come to my home to do things for me. My groceries are delivered and all these things that enable me to stay in my own home, which is very, very important for us, especially we who, who have hobbies. Uh, you know, like in a residence, I wouldn't have room for my two sewing machines. <laughs> <laughs> and my stash of fabric and my patterns. I still have, you know, a few books. I gave most of them away. But um, just these things get me up in the morning. I wake up and think, well, today maybe I'll do this. Maybe I'll do that. And like I say, if I don't accomplish anything, that's okay too. I don't, I don't fault myself. Some days I feel a bit guilty, but for the most part, I just really, and if I didn't have my sewing, um, I might stay in bed till noon. Yeah. Do you think it would just, it would just be kind of like, well, what's kind of the point? I mean, is that, yeah. 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 You know, I mean, I, I, and I still cook my own meals for the most part. And, and, um, well, I cook them all. Sometimes I buy the ready-made meals, you know, but frozen, but I try and do as much as I can mm -hmm. for myself. Yeah. And it, you know, in this is area where we live, um, I no longer can shovel my own snow, but I still like to uh, go stand out on the porch and get some fresh air once in a while because you get kind of housebound, you know. So that's my life. That's my life. Yeah. Tell me about, you know, hand quilting uh, physically. How has that changed for you over the years? You know, you said that you do you only quilt on your sawhorse frame or do you have little hoops? Oh, I don't have my sawhorse frame anymore. Okay. That was, no, I only use that for two or three quilts, but, um, a dear friend of mine made me a beautiful oak floor frame, quilt frame. Um, uh, and it sat in my living room right in front of my big windows. Nice. I just love to sit there and get up at 5 or 5.30 in the morning and I would uh, watch the sunrise. It was a, on that side of the house and it was just so beautiful and that was my quiet time. And so I did use it for many, many years. And then um, when I couldn't do big projects anymore, I gave it to his daughter who had then now taken up quilting and she hadn't been quilting until that time. So she, Anne just passed me a note and said, ask is the beeping on our end or hers? Uh, it's you... on your end. Yeah, because I'm fine. Oh. oh, oh, it's on our end, hon. 
it's it's not i i can't hear it it's not serious yeah i can't hear it oh okay okay (laughs) yeah so uh i i don't i have the frame anymore okay okay so if you wanted to hand quilt something are you mostly sticking with small projects now uh blocks Uh, are you piecing on your machine like what if you were to start something in january to carry you through 2019 what do you think that would be it would be a quilt as you go project i have a lot of um squares of batting cut out um pieces of batting that were passed to me by a girl who has a fabric store quilt shop and she, when she makes a quilt she trims the sides off and she gives me the the extras and um so i have those all ready to go and then i can put those together that's not a big problem for me but my shoulders are really bad arthritically and so i can't put things up on a design wall anymore because i can't reach up and um so that's probably what i will do i will sort of thinking about the quilt as you go quilt yeah that was really good and so you'll you'll hand you'll hand quilt each block and then put them together okay and then do you use a hoop or do you just have it on your lap what i did i bought one of these little lap hoop things that uh, frame that tilts and you know it's really a neat little thing i haven't used it very much but i'll probably use that yeah, and I have I, one of those for needlepoint, and it would be excellent for that. Yeah, yeah, it's kind of heavy, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna persevere. Yeah, good, good, good. I'm so glad to hear that that you found a way of making, you know, making it smaller and still being able to do that every day. And yeah. I, I know exactly what you mean about the importance of staying in your home. My grandmother stayed in her home, and it was a ramshackle old farmhouse that didn't have a bathroom on the first floor i mean it was just a mess but she stayed there but it was home it was really important for her to stay in her home it really was so i totally understand that and uh, that is really good so um is there anything you know kind of looking over the years is there anything that you wish that you had tried that you kind of look back and go man i wish i'd gotten into that when i could have and i can't really right now is there anything that you regret that you wish you had done well, I wish that I had persevered with the machine quilting. I tried it. And I, I have to tell you that when I Googled machine quilting to see what it was all about, uh, your website was well, among the ones that came up. And I settled on yours. And so I have been kind of following you since then. And that would be probably five or six years ago. And... Uh, as a matter of fact, I think I passed your name on to Anne. I'm not sure. But anyway, when I wanted some ideas, and maybe there was just a single block that you did, I would maybe copy that onto a block. You know, as I was, I did a lot of quilt as you go quilts. So, but I wish I had persevered. I tried it and I just could not get it. I couldn't. For free motion quilting. Did you ever try yeah. walking foot quilting? <laughs> No, I just I just don't have the the rhythm, or I I don't know what it is, but yeah, maybe you can't do both, but then you do both. <laughs> yeah, well, there's so many different types now, and I think yeah. walking foot quilting it's a bigger it's a bigger kind of clunkier foot, but it uh-huh. will it will feed the quilt for you, and so you just let it stitch, and it works yeah. more like your sewing machine. So you might want to try that and just give it another go, because you know it's never too late to try it. <laughs> No, but it's the designs, you know, like I tried doing feathers. Anne loves her feathers. I've tried and tried. I could not get it. But as one of my girlfriends said, she's an an expert quilter. She said, Anne is a musician. She has the rhythm. (laughs) I quilt. I have to have music in the background because I'm not a musician. So she figures that's that's the key. You got to be a musician. <laughs> oh, that's interesting. You know, it's, yeah. it's really funny. Actually, um, I told you I had gone to a music store today and I was a drummer for uh, oh. nine years through um, oh middle goodness. school and high school. And it never felt natural. Never felt natural. Really? I was always fighting it and fighting oh. to find that rhythm. But, you know, free motion quilting right. kind of comes. It came instantly. It came, it came natural. Yeah. So, 
you know, yeah, yeah I think, I, I think more yeah. than anything else, it's practice, it's sticking with it. But, you know, it sounds like you had such a skill for hand quilting that that was really what you kind of kept coming back to. And that's totally understandable. Um, can you tell well, us? I like, yeah. Sorry, I like hand work. Like, I like the feel of the fabric in yeah. my hand. Absolutely. You know, to touch it. Yeah, yeah. So tell me what your favorite hand quilting design was. Well, I didn't do a lot of things like the machine quilting is done, the meandering and the feathers and, and the diamonds. And like when I look at your work and Anne's work, uh, mine was mostly just the, the outline of the design of the fabric, you know? Minimal. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Like if you have a, a, had the square, um, maybe to do um, or what do they a lemon? What do they melon melon design quilting in it, or or just to echo the the outline of the square or the rectangle or whatever? Yeah. Mm. Then I could make it as dense as I wanted, or or, or not. Yeah, yeah, and I I love that because. You know, sometimes I feel like we quilt our quilts to death now. I mean, we have the ability yep. to, so that's what we tend to do. And right, I've been right. pulling back this year and trying to say, no, let's only quilt it as much as it needs. Right. And it's actually hard, you know, when, when quilting and like throwing more thread at it is so easy. It's exactly. hard to only yes, do the minimum. Stop. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> oh, uh, Exactly. So uh, in my limited hand quilting experience, so I only, like I said, I only quilted that one day, but I had so much fun. Um, but I realized hand quilting is very unique because you're hyper focused. Your, your, your face is like, you know, inches from the quilt and you're stitching uh, for hours. And like I was doing a cross hatching design and I noticed two things. Number one, it is so easy to be really picky about the stitches. And then the yes. other thing was, it's really easy to make mistakes, like a lot yes. easier than you would think. So what's your perspective on that? Well, I, I don't, I did pick out stitches because I'm kind of a perfectionist <laughs> and I never left anything in that I wasn't happy with. That's yeah. about all I can say about it. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it was really easy to veer. Like we were going from point to point on a uh, yes. on an Irish chain, a double Irish chain, and you oh, would think yes. that it would be easy to stitch across those big open spaces, but it was surprisingly easy to make a mistake and like that, veer that. into another direction. <laughs> right? Yeah. Yeah. So tell me about being a perfectionist. Like um, you said, you ripped out some stitches. Uh, has was that really something that kind of you feel like held you back or do you think it made your projects better well I think it made them better <laughs> then they look nicer <laughs> like I'm, I'm thinking about stitching within a square patch you know and you get to the corner and I was really fussy about the spacing so if the needle didn't come out right at the, the quarter inch in from the edge of the little square, I ripped back a little bit, a few stitches. <laughs> oh, my gosh. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> and I still do that. <laughs> wow. Yeah, that's yeah. almost like, you know, that's almost like, I think it's Sashiko, the Japanese style of quilting where you, like, oh, count yes. and space yeah. your stitches just perfectly. That reminds me more of that. I can't even imagine um yeah. wow wow that's pretty intense if I'm, if I'm just doing like like pot holders or something like that I do I don't worry about it but if it's something special sure. I do yeah yeah so did you ever try big stitch hand quilting where you take intentional I big have, chunky stitches I haven't but I want to I think that's coming there you <laughs> that go probably my next project yeah I I have some patterns that I've saved and um, I have some nice embroidery thread, and, and I think I'm going to try that. Yeah. You'll have to give yourself permission <laughs> to stitch big. The big stitch. It's going to be different, but it's going to be fun, I think. Excellent. So this is yeah. the last question I always ask everybody on this show, and I'd love to hear what you have to say. What are you most looking forward to and excited about for the next five years? Being in my own home and continuing the way I'm going. 
I have no great expectations. I'd just be happy with, with the way I am. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for being on the show and sharing with us today, Sue. I really appreciate it. Thanks for having me, Leah. It was a real treat. So that's it for this episode. If you'd like to find more episodes of the Hello, My Quilting Friends podcast, check it out at leahday.com slash podcast.